Hey, everybody, it's Tommy Canelli, and welcome back to Before the Lights podcast, the show to find out how those in sports, music, and entertainment made their mark. Today, a producer, writer, director, and actor that has created some of the movie industry's most memorable action scenes, a stuntman who has jumped cars and motorcycles through glass, fire, and wood in shows such as Knight Rider and Dukes of Hazard. He has fallen from a 12-story building and has directed the second unit as a stunt coordinator in movies such as Fast Five, Hangover 3, Date Night, Money Train, and many, many more. He's a member of the Directors Guild of America, the Screen Actors Guild, and the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Science. He has won several stunt awards in a career that spans over 45 years. Please welcome to the show, Jack Gill. Jack, welcome to Before the Lights. Hey, thanks, Tommy. Your father was a two-star general in the Air Force and was stationed at the Pentagon. What was life like for you as a child? Well, it was a lot more stringent than most of my friends, um, <laughs> just because the military has, you know, a pretty strict upbringing. But I think it really helped me out in the fact that, you know, we all kind of had to hold the line and you understood why you had to do it. And, you know, I have a, a, a younger brother and an older sister. And with three of us, we moved around a lot. And, you know, you were always trying to find new friends pretty quickly. But luckily, we settled in Atlanta, Georgia for quite a lot of my high school years. And, um, you know, my father never really pushed the military on me completely because I was racing motorcycles professionally at that time and making money at it. So, you know, I think the military part of it made me a better person. And the fact that my father didn't force me into a career that I wasn't really ready for at the time was was even better. And I've tried to you know push that into my kids too. let them do what they really want to do, not what you want them to do. You mentioned that you were a professional motocross rider before Hal Nee met you. You've always been an adrenaline junkie. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, I, I started riding motorcycles when I was around six. My parents bought me a little mini bike. And I was a turned professional at 14, which you couldn't really do that nowadays. But back then, you could be a pro, you know, under 18. And it was, um, you know, it was uh, inspiring for me because I could do something well. And racing is an adrenaline junkie type of sport. And, you know, I played football a little bit. I played baseball a little bit. I, I was kind of always an athlete. But the motocross part of it was something that I just felt was kind of my niche. And uh, once I got into it, I thought that's what I would do my entire life until I met Hal Needham. Hal Needham, a stuntman who then directed movies such as Smoking the Bandit and Cannibal Run. If you would, I know you've told the story probably a thousand times. If you would tell my listeners about meeting Hal and how that turned into becoming a stuntman. Well, I was on the motocross racing circuit down in Florida. I had won a bunch of races at this one thing because back then you rode three different classes of motorcycles, different CCs. And so... I had won all three of them, and my picture was in the local paper, and I was checking out of a Holiday Inn. And as I was checking out, this guy looks over and sees my picture and says, is that you? And I went, yeah. And he goes, you won all three of these events? And I went, yeah. And he goes, think you can jump a motorcycle over a bunch of cars? And I said, well, if I have you know, the right motorcycle and I can build a ramp, I think I can. And he goes, all right, come out to California in a week, and um, I'll get you a job to do it. And he introduces himself and tells me what he did. And I said, is this for real? And he goes, yeah, you know, get in your van and drive out to California and we'll see if you want to be a stunt guy. And the best part about it was the fact that he got me started in it and got me to where I saw something that I could see a real future in. But he did say, I don't want you to throw my name around. I don't want you to tell anybody that you know me. I want you to try and make it in the business on your own. If you have questions, call me up, but don't go around telling everybody that you know me and we're friends. Once you have made it in the business on your own, then maybe we'll work together and maybe we'll get something going. But until then, just try and make it as a stunt guy. And that helped me more than anything because it makes you really work for what you have to do as opposed to somebody just giving it to you. So I think that advice I've tried to, you know, push on to other stunt people that come up to me and say, hey, you know, I'd like to get in the business. So I try and keep that same form going. In 1976, you were uncredited for stunts in Gator. And then as a stunt player in 1979, Rock and Roll High School. Jack, what was your first <laughs> stunt on screen then? God, on screen. Um, 
it was probably rock and roll high school. I mean, because uh, all I did was run down the hall, trip and fall, and a guy trips over me and go, we both go down the stairs. That was about it. But before that, before you get, these are all credits that go into a database and are union-based credits. Before that, I was working, you know, in little bitty low-budget films, riding motorcycles in these, I did a thing called um, Do It in the Dirt, which was a motorcycle racing film. And it had Frank Sinatra Jr. in it and Darby Hinton, and I doubled both of them and, you know, rode motorcycles, which is what I really did. And so a lot of those, you don't see those credits. So that's kind of not really being in the business yet because it's not a union-based film, but I think Rock and Roll High School was probably the first one that was a union-based film. How is being a double add to pulling off a stunt? Is it more complex? Yeah, it's a lot more complex than most people think, only because in today's filming world, the people that watch movies and TV are a lot more savvy to things that they see than they were 20, 30 years ago. Um, and because our TV screens are so much bigger and the receptor, I mean, uh, the resolution so much better that, you know, our doubles that we bring into double actors have to learn body movements. They have to learn what the character is about. They have to know that if it's a comedy, there's certain body movements you have to do to mimic the actor. And sometimes the stunt guy will do things that are funnier than what the actor does. And the actor ends up mimicking the stunt guy. So it works both ways. And it's something that you do have to learn because, you know, you're, you're, I guess you're graded on your last, you know, job that you did as in any profession, they remember what your last job was. And if you screw something up, it gets around in our business pretty quickly because we are such a tight knit, small community. And so you really want to make sure that you know what you're doing before you step out there in the limelight. I'm guessing here that you have to be in top physical condition to pull off stunts. So what kind of training does a stuntman have to do? Most of the time you're rehearsing on the weekends, you're trying to work during the week, but most stunt guys and stunt women, and stunt women don't work, but maybe two or three days a week, unless you get on a big show. But we're training on the weekends almost every weekend. And you're training, you know, martial arts and you're training in cars and you're training on motorcycles. You do something different every weekend and you just meet as a group. It's not really put together, you know, by anybody other than just you and your friends get together and say, hey, Let's take our cars out to this parking lot and rent the parking lot and we'll put some cones up and practice this. Or you go out to a dirt field where a motocross track is and you practice motocross wrecks, which is not a lot of fun. But, you know, you do get bruised up, and but you learn the way to do things or not to do things. And another way it used to be when I got in the business is you could get on to the back lots of all the major uh, movie studios and watch other people work and learn that way. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, the movie industry and the TV industry is spread out throughout the world, and it's very difficult to find things that are shooting in Los Angeles or, you know, Atlanta is the big movie capital now. That's probably the place to go to see most people work. But you do learn a lot by watching other people make mistakes and do the right things. And so it's still not the same as going out and doing it yourself, but at least you get an idea of what big stunts really look like. With stunt preparation and safety practices, and you have done so much with being a stunt coordinator, how much science and math is needed to pull off the stunt to make it feel real? An unbelievably large amount, because you would be surprised at how much goes into just a simple car stunt. Um, you know, I do a bunch of the Fast and Furious movies as a stunt coordinator and a second year director, and and when we have car stunts, we've usually got, you know, 30 cars in a sequence all going 80, 90 miles an hour through town. And we've got 10 to 15 camera operators spread out through the town. And if any one of those cars makes a mistake, you know, people's lives are at stake. So you have to make sure that every single camera is protected. If a car gets loose, you've got cement barriers in front of them. You've got stunt people on the camera operators that can pull them out of the way if we're in trouble. You've got to look at the pedestrians that want to watch you film. So that's always a big issue. And you've also got to look at people who could care less about the movie industry and just want to get to their job and step out in the street to cross the street because they see an empty street, but don't realize there's cars doing 90 miles an hour coming from the left. So there's quite a lot to it. And then when you get a, you know, a writer's um, idea of what he wants to put in the script, usually we can tell them, Sure, it's doable, or can I change it a little bit, and we can still make what you what you visualize to work, 
but we just have to change it a little bit because in today's world, we try not to do any CGI if we don't have to, especially in you know the vehicle world with motorcycles and cars, because the viewing public is very savvy to what's CGI, what is you know not real and what is real. And so the more you can make it real, the more the audience viewers feel like they're part of the movie and they feel like they're in that car with the action star. So, you know, it's got a lot to do with computers because we do have a lot of figuring out how far his car can travel and how far more motorcycles can jump and how long you can set a guy on fire and survive it. There's a lot to it. And people just don't really understand what goes into it. Just listening to you, the word that comes to my mind is precision, that everything has to be yeah. precise. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's strange because, you know, the, a movie I just finished in Paris, you know, we were working right in downtown Paris, and there's tons of people that want to watch us shoot. And we've got cars going very fast through the sequence. And luckily, you know, you're at a point you, you know, where you can call up other people. And I had to call up friends of mine. I, and I said, you shot in Paris before. What have I got to really watch out for? And they give you tips. So the great part about having the Internet today is you can almost find out anything about anybody in any location just by searching the internet, which we didn't have 30, 40 years ago. How has the invention of the jump harness changed your industry? <laughs> um, when they first, we, we kind of designed the jump harness back in 1979 on Dukes of Hazard, And we did that because there were a lot of stunt people breaking their backs trying to jump cars. Mm. Um, it was almost 80%. Anybody that took a car up more than five or six feet in the air was breaking their back. So in Dukes of Hazard. Jerry Summers and Bobby Orris and the two stunt guys that were on the show put this kind of, it's like a vest that goes around your body that doesn't incorporate your bottom. It's just like a vest, like a corset a woman wears. Okay. And it has hooks in the top of the shoulders and they tie you into bungee cord, which sounds completely crazy into the ceiling of the roll bar. So that your head's up against the ceiling of the car and then stretch out the bungee, which pulls underneath your shoulders and put you in a five-point safety harness. Now, you're suspended both top and bottom. Your rear end kind of sits off the seat about two or three inches, and your head's about four or five inches from the roof. So when you jump this car 10, 12 feet in the air, and it's dropping, you've got a 4,500-pound car. When it hits, you're, it's pulling underneath your armpits, and it keeps your spine from collapsing into the seat. So on Dukes of Hazard, I jumped the General Lee through a barn, and it came out the other side and turned over two times on the other side. I didn't have a scratch on me, didn't have any injuries at all. And since that day in 1979, we're still using the same jump harness with, you know, retrofits on it, but it's still exactly the same idea. And it still works to this day and we still use it. So it's something that has revolutionized the business and kept people safer, I think. Wow. Unbelievable. If something from the 70s still pretty much the same way as it was. <laughs> and has not been modernized. That's awesome. Jack, you've jumped from exploding boats, mountaintops, and hung from helicopters. What's the scariest stunt you've performed personally? That's an easy one. Um, back in 1980, early 1980, I got a call from a stunt coordinator who said, hey, I've got this thing where this airplane comes over at night and drops napalm on the top of this cliff. And you start running away from the napalm. And as the fire is catching you, it blows you off the top of the cliff. And we want you to fall 65 feet into an airbag at night. And we've had six other stunt guys turn it down. And I hear you're really good on this thing called an air ram. And I'll explain to you what an air ram is in a minute. But, you know, I went out to the location, looked at it in the daytime. And the hill was 65 feet, but it wasn't sheer. It wasn't a sheer drop. It was... It was a hill that had kind of a slope to it. So the closest you could put the airbag at the bottom of this 65 foot drop was about 20 feet. And so you had to clear to jump out 20 feet just to get to the tip of the airbag. So that's why everybody was turning it down. So back in like 1979, they invented this thing called the air ramp, which is essentially a, a gymnastics beat board like they use in gym, uh, gym gymnasiums where you jump on it, it has springs on it. But we replace the springs with hydraulic rams. So when you step on it, it fires the hydraulic rams, shoots you up in the air, and you go a longer distance than you normally would off a springed beat board. The problem with it is it's so fast that if you're not in front of the hydraulic rams, 
it collapses your legs and you end up right in the same spot you did. And you have 13 gallons of gasoline going off and it's not a good thing. So I had practiced this on flat ground for about two weeks before I agreed to do it. And I saw that I could get about 22 feet with this air ram. So I knew I could get the distance to the, to the airbag. So I got on the top of the cliff and I set this whole thing up and this guy starts pouring gasoline right behind the air ram. And he's putting 13 gallons of raw gasoline right behind the air ram. And I said, so when I step on this thing, the gasoline goes and he goes, yeah, it goes off when you, when it triggers the air ram. So I said, can we tip this thing back a little bit? So it's not right on top of me. And he said, sure. So we tip it back a little bit. And then they put another eight gallon gasoline pod in the side of the mountain. And then they put five or six cameras down below and right before getting ready to do it, I said, let me just put the air ram out on flat ground and test it one more time to make sure I can get 20 feet. And I hit it once. It works great. I hit it again. And I'm just going to pads on flat ground. And I hit it the second time and it misfires. It doesn't go off. And I turned around to the effects guy and said, does that mean the gas still goes off? And he said, yeah, we're tied into your button. Even if that doesn't fire, you're still getting the gasoline. And I said, well, that's not good. So I hit it again. It doesn't <laughs> fire again. So I tell the director, we're not doing it. And he starts screaming and yelling at me. And it's now three in the morning and it's cold. And they said they had another air ram and they were going to go home and get it. So they run home. We're still waiting. The director's yelling at me. They bring another air ram back there. We stick it out there. I hit it three or four times. It works great. I said, don't move it. Bring everything out there. Don't disconnect anything. Stick it on the end of the cliff without disconnecting anything. I hit it. I go up in the air. It was probably the biggest hardest hit I've ever had because it felt like somebody took the flat end of a boat paddle and hit me in the back with it when this thing went off and I'll send you pictures later but as I fly through the air I can see everybody on the ground running the other direction and I thought oh I missed the airbag I've gone too far I'm going to hit the ground and as I start turning over I see that I'm going to hit the airbag and I had put a tarp in the middle of the airbag in case I was on fire when I hit the tarp the tarp knocks around me and puts the fire out and I climb out of the airbag and I've got my safety guys all around me and I'm fine and everything's good but three quarters of those camera operators all ran away from the camera because the fire was raining down on top of them and they were trying to get away from the fire so I got paid a whopping $750 for that one wow <laughs> and it was uh at that time in my career I thought it was a lot of money I really was happy to be able to do it and happy to know that I could do something that a lot of other people turned it down, but I would never, ever do it again. In today's world, they wouldn't even let you do it. You would do it as a two-part pass with no fire and you'd be on a cable. So the business has totally changed to what it was back then. I understand. Is it true that you have a six inch titanium plate in your neck? And if so, <laughs> what happened that, that that's now there? Well, I've broken my back twice and my neck once and 23 broken bones and punctured both my lungs. And, you know, it's over, over the years as a stuntman, I like to try and parallel it to being a pro football player and a police officer because you know you're going to get hurt eventually and you hope you can survive those. But there are times when your life's on the line and, and sometimes you don't even think these stunts are dangerous and they end up biting you. And sometimes they can be very bad. And both times I broke my back were things that I thought were pretty easy and they just bit me. And when I broke my neck, it was essentially compounded over the years of Dukes of Hazard and Knight Rider with all of the car jumps that I did on both of those shows, doing a car jump a week, every single week for five years on Dukes of Hazard and six years on, on Knight Rider or five years on Knight Rider. You know, your, your back was helped by this hang harness but your neck, you couldn't help the whiplash every single time. Even though I had a big foam collar underneath my neck and a helmet on, it's still you're still getting whiplash every day. So I broke my neck, and they put this titanium plate in, and it's probably the best thing I ever did because I was getting paralysis in my right arm, and I kept having to sling my right arm out to try and get the feeling back in it. And um, I did this car turner over on this picture called Blues Brothers 2000, and the car was upside down. I turned it, turned it over like six times. And when they got to me, I said, don't move me. Put a neck collar on me. I think my neck's broken. Um, and they put a neck collar on me, and I went straight to the hospital. And he said, look, your neck's been broken for probably two years. You've had pieces floating around in there. And this last turnover just popped one right next to your vertebrae. So you've got to get this thing out because your spinal column, you know, is not going to survive another one of these. So I had 
this tiny titanium plate put in and I've got pins and screws in my wrists and I've got pins and screws in all my elbow and I just have lots of stuff but luckily I'm still pretty healthy and I'm still racing motorcycles I've got a track at my house and I feel lucky to be in the shape that I'm in now even with all the injuries and if you talk to any stunt person that says I've been in the business 20 years and never been injured they haven't been doing stunts because you're eventually gonna get hurt it's just the way it is with all those injuries then, Jack, what's the mental toll on that? And then coming back and doing it again on something that you've just had a major injury on. It's tough. It's, and it's, it's tough once you have a family and kids. It's, um, I think it's harder on my wife and my children than it is on me because I kind of know what I'm doing and I know what's at stake. And back when I was doing Fall Guy, I was jumping a motorcycle over two moving cars going down the road. And we had a drag ramp in the back of the second car. And I had to hit the, the, this drag ramp and jump over two cars going down the road. And I'm doing probably 85 miles an hour when I hit them. So if you crash on the other side, it's not good. And my wife said she wanted to come out and see it. And I said, well, I'm probably going to do it around noon. And I had done my part of it earlier because they wanted to get it over with. And I got everything done at like 10 o'clock. And they said, oh, we've got this other guy that's going to do the same thing as another character. And just as she was driving in, he had wrecked and they had put him in the ambulance. She followed the ambulance all the way to the hospital thinking it was me and then got there and it was not me. And since then, she never wanted to come out to the set again. So it's tough on your family. It's tough on kids. When you do get injured, you know, badly, you really have to kind of look at your career and say, do you really want to keep doing this? And I know a bunch of friends of mine who have had bad injuries that did get out of the business strictly because their family couldn't take it anymore. And it's tough. It's not an easy business for anybody or their family, but you know, we are a tight knit group and we do help each other with injuries and everybody goes to try and help out, you know, the families as much as we can. And we all donate to this fund where it's to injured stunt people and their families. And when they are injured, you know, we, we your medical bills are kind of paid, paid for, but you don't have any income. So we try and help other stunt families with that. So, like I say, it's poor, more difficult on the families than it is on the stunt person yourself. There has to be more pressure, I would think, on a stunt man because you guys only get one take at it. Where actors, they can yell cut and redo it and change lighting and stuff, but you're really only getting one shot at this stunt. Would that be correct? <laughs> That's correct in, in most cases, but that's only for the really, really big stunts. In the stunts where you're crashing cars and doing stuff, like on Fast and Furious, we have four or five cars for four or five takes. And if they don't like the way the car reacted, you put the stunt guy back in the same car and he does it again, but you're paying him again for it. So he's lucky to do it again if it all works well. On the really big stuff, you don't like to take chances. If you get it right once and the director says he wants it again, usually you go over and say, look, you know, it's not the fact that I'm paying this guy again, but the risks are now much higher because he got through this without getting hurt. And I don't want to really take the risk again, unless you didn't get the shot. If you didn't get the shot, let's talk about it. And maybe we can make it safer, but you don't want to keep, you know, prodding the, the odds because the odds are going to bite you eventually. So a lot of times I have to go to directors and say, we got two good takes out of it. Let's move on. Let's not try and think that we're going to get through this with as many as you want, because you're going to get somebody hurt. And they usually completely understand or say, okay, let's break it into different pieces and only do one piece here. And then one piece there. And you can try sometimes get it done that way. But in today's world, because stunts are so big, you have to be real careful about, just doing it again because it looks really cool. Let's see it again. We've got the money. Let's put another car in there. And sometimes they'll bite you and they'll bite you bad. With a career that spanned over 45 years, are you still learning in the industry today about stunt work? I am learning every single day. I mean, I, the good part about still being in this business is that I do have a, a, a wide range of things that I've done and I can always look back on the things that I've done and then call other people who have done kind of similar things and say, you know, let's, let's kind of put our heads together. And the thing that I've learned over the years, more than anything, is that it's good to have the whole crew involved in each and every stunt, because sometimes we'll round table what we're getting ready to do. 
and I've got everybody sitting around me, the entire crew, and I'll say, okay, I've explained exactly what, what this stunt's about. You know what we're going to do from A to B. Has anybody got any questions, or does anything really bother you? Do you think you can make it any better? Sometimes somebody that's sitting in the background will say something that will completely, will get missed by everybody. Like one guy said, well, I saw this kind of homeless people and they were over in this uh, dumpster back there. And aren't you going to hit that dumpster, you know, two shots from now? And I went, yeah, that's the dumpster we brought out here. And he goes, well, there's two people sleeping in that dumpster. So something like that, you just, it's good to have everybody's opinion on what's, when you're doing something dangerous, you just never know. Somebody may come up with something that saves somebody's life. So you just never know what that is. But that's what I've learned over the years is get everybody involved. How fun is your job? And is there ever a dull day? You know, I get that a lot. And it is an adrenaline push and I really enjoy my job, but there are a lot of injuries to it. And when you're in the injury injury stage, you're in pain a lot. You're trying to get over it and it's really tough. And, you know, you're not making any money at the time. And so that's the tough part about it. And the tough part about it is you're visiting a lot of stunt friends that are in the hospital. So it's not something that is for the lighthearted because you have to understand that, yes, you work a lot. And if you're good at your job, you know, you're working probably three or four days a week. But there are times when you won't work for three or four months. And you've got to understand that you better have a savings for when that happens, because that's when you're hurt. So you can't just go blow money right and left because you have to have kind of a nest egg available for when you are injured because you are going to get injured. So I really enjoy my job. I enjoy the fact that nowadays I'm pretty much just pointing fingers and telling the young guys what to do. And sometimes you have to go up to these young stunt guys saying, look, this is going to hurt. I've done it before and you're young and you'll heal up, but you're probably not going to break any bones, but you're going to have a lot of bumps and bruises and, it's just the way it is. And you just have to toughen up. So it's fun to see other stunt guys do stuff that I've done and uh, I enjoy it, but like, I still like to jump in cars and slide them around corners and hit other cars. That's what I can do still. And, you know, I'm 66 years old and still doing it and happy. So it's one of those types of things that if you're, if you like what you do, stick at it. If you can, it's just, it's just something that my wife probably wishes I would retire, but <laughs> I just don't have that. The drilling part of it is just part of me. How is doing stunts with animals bringing complex into the picture? <laughs> it's, it's tough with animals. Um, it, it's really tough. And only because usually when we're doing stunts with animals, we're having to fight with them. And that's the tough part. And I had to do a thing, this TV show called Frank Buck, bring them back alive. And they wanted me to double the lead actor and put my arm around this Bengal tiger and then walk with this Bengal tiger down there. And then the tiger then is supposed to be wrestling around with her, supposed to play. And the actor didn't want to do it. And I thought, okay, you know, I, I guess I can do this. And so they introduced me to the tiger and we kind of got to know each other ever really well. And we get out there and I put my arm around him and they're rolling camera and I'm walking with him. And then we just start playing around and it's grow going great. But this Bengal tiger weighs about 250 pounds and, you know, I'm playing around with him goofing and somebody on, an, you know, the set far away from us cranks up a chainsaw to do something. And I can't even see it. But when the chainsaw goes off, this tiger took his whole attitude changed and he turned at me and growled. And I hear the trainer go, get out of there, get out of there, get out of there. And I just kind of rolled over three or four times and the tiger took off the other direction, luckily, and they caught the tiger and got him. But, uh, you know, things like that happen with animals and you can't fault them. It's not their fault. But, you know, with some guys, you are put in situations where animals where you have to do things that most people don't do with animals. Like we dropped 10 rattlesnakes on a stunt guy's head out mm. of the top of a cave. And, uh, you know, the trainer is going, yeah, they won't bite you. We've got rubber bands around their mouths. And we're going, what if the rubber band comes off? What <laughs> happens then? And he goes, oh, well, we have boots on you. And we're going, yeah, but you're still dropping them on his head. So things like that happen. I had to wrestle an alligator once and they had his mouth taped shut. But when I jumped on him in the water, he just took me straight to the bottom and started rolling with me on the bottom. And I had to let go and go back to the top. But, you know, you just it's it's oddball things that you do in this business that, you know, at the time where they say, okay, Jack, you're coming to the set and we're going to have this eight foot alligator you're going to jump on top of. 
and wrestle with him on the surface. Well, he wouldn't stay on the surface. He knew he could take me to the bottom and deal with me down there. And that's not what they wanted to see. So it's, it's an oddball, oddball game, but you, you try and just roll with the punches. You did over a hundred episodes of Dukes of Hazard as a stunt driver and a stunt double. John Schneider was going to be a, wanted to be a stunt man at one time as well. He did. John Schneider and I went to the same high school in Atlanta, Georgia. And when I decided I was going to drop everything and go out there and with Hal Needham and try and be a stunt guy, John wanted to come with me. But John was three years younger than I was. And his parents said, you can't go. You're way too young. So I had been out in California when Dukes of Hazard came about and I had heard about it. And, you know, I knew that they were looking at 5,000 different people that were auditioning for the part of Bo Duke. And when John came out, he had, he, you know, he's from Atlanta. He comes from a background of that kind of thing. And John got the part on Dukes of Hazard. And the next thing I know, John and I talking about it, he goes, Hey, you know, there's this, we've got all the stunt guys out here. Why don't you come out here and double me on the show? And so, you know, we're still great friends today and we still hang out together and he was at my wedding. And, you know, it's one of those types of things you would never think that somebody you went to high school with, you'd end up doubling him on a TV show for five years. So a lot of fun. I'll bet. Jack, what's it like working with Marvel Cinematic Universal and those types of movies? Well, the major studios, um, when you do big action films, you know, going in that it's going to be a big commitment because with every single action film that we do, they obviously want to one up the one that they had before. Mm. So everything has to be bigger and, you know, and better, and you have to come up with better ideas. So we let, we have a team of stunt people that we keep in our group that we all have, we kind of round table ideas of big things that we can do and pitch to the studios. Once you read the script, you try and throw in all these big ideas and sometimes they're completely outlandish but somebody else will kind of tag team onto that idea and make it a little more believable. And then you say, okay, we've got a really good idea here. So, so a lot of times the scripts that we read don't have the action written. They wait for the stunt coordinator and the action uh, director to get involved. And then you start pitching what you can do. Like, you know, airplanes out of the back of, you know, C-130s on Fast 7 was something that we had done before on another project, on a commercial we pitched that to him and said, what if we did it with six cars, six cars coming out of the back of the airplane and everybody's on a parachute. And so we had to rehearse that before we could get it all done. But things like that are really big and they're big for feature films. And now that we've got wires, we can put stunt people on wires and the computer can erase them. You can throw people off of buildings without airbags and they can, the camera can follow them all the way down to the ground and you slow them down right before the ground. So you know, there's lots of things that have come to pass in today's world that have helped our business be a lot more safe than it was when I first started. So there was probably a lot more injuries when I first started in the business than there are now. And there were a lot more injuries in Hal Needham's age than there were when I got started. So the business has gotten much more safer than it was when I started and when Hal started. But I like to say that we've all gotten better because CGI has helped us and the safety part of it has helped us. Fast five, fast and furious, six, seven, and fade and furious. Do you have any idea just off the top of your head, how many cars you guys have wrecked in those, in that series? God, way over 300. I know because, you know, in one sequence in, in fast eight, we, we put 46 cars out of the parking structure we crashed 46 cars out of a parking structure into a pile so that Vin Diesel's character could climb up top, on top of them. And we did it for real. We crashed seven at a time, and we had seven spots where we could throw the cars out of this parking structure. And we had stunt guys in crash cars coming from two different sides, and we had X's on the ground to where we knew the cars were going to hit from the parking structure. So we said, as the stunt guys, you guys are coming in at speed. We're going to start launching the cars out of the parking structure don't be on over that X before your car hits the ground or it's going to hit on top of you. So you have to time it. So it just hits and then you can hit it. And then we had a pile of 46 cars. So, you know, fast and furious, we do go through a lot of cars and I think that's what people enjoy about it is, is the mayhem of all the cars and everything. And, and we enjoy it as well too, but they're not, 
brand new cars. They're usually water damaged cars that we put new engines in them and paint them and make them look like they're brand new. So we're not damaging very expensive cars, but you know, we do have cars that are our character cars that have the best engines in them, the best brakes in them, the best everything you can think of. Like Vin Diesel's, you know, car, they, we always have to wheelie it in every single Fast and Furious. And everybody loves to see that. And it's it's great for us to be able to show the public that we can, act, we can actually wheelie a car still. So still a lot of fun. We're started, we're getting ready to start Fast and Furious 10. So, you know, the, the series just keeps going. Yes, it does. You began a campaign in 1991 and created an Oscars category for stunts. Where is this at currently? It's still in the same spot it always was. I mean, I think, you know, after 30 years, we just can't seem to convince the Academy that the action industry is worthwhile. Um, They have this this attitude that we don't really give anything back to the industry. And when I start talking about action films make more money than any other film drama or comedy or anything else in the business – they don't believe that money plays a part of it. They believe that it's content. And I said, okay, great. Think of a movie like Ben-Hur. Take the chariot race out of Ben-Hur. What kind of movie do you have? And they said, well, that movie would still play great without the chariot race. <laughs> so that's what they believe. And so I've tried to change some of their, you know, their attitudes in it, but it's been a road that is just, it's it's hard to change their minds because they think that a three-person drama where just three people talk and they never go outside of a building is what they really want to see. They don't believe in action films. They don't believe that they, you know, should be, should have their own category. And when I talked about Mad Max, you know, Thunder Road, this one that that it was nominated for eight Academy Awards and won six of them, I think, or 10 and won eight. And when I, I mentioned that to them, it's an all action film. There's barely anything in it that's not action. And they still said, I said, take the action out of that movie would the eight or 10 nominations still be there? And they have no answer to that. They think that was a fluke. So I'm still pushing. I'm still pushing hard. What I'm really trying now is to get the major studios. I want to get them involved and see if they can help me push the agenda. Because if their publicity firms can put a little help into it, because they can benefit a lot. If they get an Academy Award Oscar, they can put that into promoting their films. If I can get the major industry film film studios to help me with it i think we might be able to get you know a category is there anything my listeners or myself can do to help with the cause yes um try and contact the academy directly they have you know it's the academy of motion picture arts and scientists and sciences and it's one of those that they have an email uh, train and they have it's called amtps and it's one of those things where the more emails that they can get this saying we need a category is helpful but also contact the major studios, you know, all of the Marvel industries, the universal Warner brothers, Disney, tell them we should have an action category, get your, you know, your company involved in trying to get an action category. We'd love to see an action, you know, Oscar for, you know, uh, fast and furious or any kind of a Marvel movie or all the Disney movies. I mean, there's just so much content of action and in our day and age, we'll just, we'll, all these movies go by the way, wayside without any kind of, you know, commitment where all of our friends are getting Oscars. We're not getting anything. So listeners go to my show notes. I'm going to put a link to the Academy of motion picture and sciences, and also see if I can find the email address and put it there. So you can click on it and help Jack with this cause and send an email into the Academy and see if we can help make something happen for this. It's way done overdue. It needs to be done. Jack, how does somebody these days get into stunt work? Um, Usually it's because you excel at one thing that we really need. Um, Like I've seen, you know, gymnasts that come off the Olympic circuit and we need somebody of their talents to do something. We bring them in for that or like pro motocross racers, or, you know, there's a lot of different avenues in the athletic industry that we use for that. But somebody who's just a good all around athlete can still get into business as well. You do have to train quite a lot and you do have to, you know, it, it, there's more to it than you think of just being a good athlete. There's a lot of knowing the business and knowing, uh, having a lot of common sense, knowing when to say no to certain things and to say, I think I can do it a different way without, with the odds getting better in my favor. 
that's a lot of it. Because I over the years, over my 40 years, I've seen stunt people who are unbelievable athletes, but never made it into business because they had no common sense and they kept getting hurt. And so things like that do play a big part in our business. So having kind of a sixth sense, having a good common sense about trying to figure out things ahead of time really helps you in this business. And you've got to be a, a person who understands that when you do get hurt, you have to make decisions and you have to make decisions quick as to whether you're going to get back in the business or not. And a lot of people, the first time they got injured, they get out of the business because they just can't take it. And I've had friends of mine who are excellent motocross racers, much faster than I ever was. And they tried to get in the business. The very first time I asked them to wreck, they went, I don't like that at all. And they left. So you just never know. It's a, it's a strange mentality of the stunt person, but it's one that, you know, it doesn't pay a whole lot. It doesn't pay what actors pay, but there is a big adrenaline push for it. And it's something that for me, it's not the money. It's not the adrenaline. It's the fact that I can sit in a room and somebody can tell me that you can't do this and I can figure out how to do it. And then when I see the finished product, I can go back in that room and everybody is going, I can't believe that you could actually pull that off. That's what is in it for me. I like to be able to to tell people, you know, I did something you told me I couldn't do and I pulled it off. What's the future of stunt work like? And is there a possibility that some of the stuff that's being done by actual stunt people could be replaced with remote controls or robots or something like that? They've been saying that for the last 20 years and uh, the audience is too savvy for that. They know if they see it digitally, they don't believe that it's real. And I know with a lot of the Marvel movies, when you've got people flying through space and everything, obviously you can't do that real. But when you get down to the stuff that people know is supposed to be real, like a big fight scene or something where you're crashing through windows and falling off buildings and they want to see real guys doing real things. And if it's CGI, they don't just don't get excited anymore. And so we saw a big change in it about 10 years ago. We saw it going way into the CG world. And when I did Fast Five, we got back. They wanted to really pull have two cars pull a 9,000 pound safe behind two cars and they wanted to do it CGI. And we said, no, I think I can do it real. And so the producer who was Neil Moritz said, sure, if you can do it, let me see it. Once we started doing that, when fast five came out and they saw that we were really doing stuff real, the whole industry kind of changed around and we, everybody in the industry started doing things real again. And the profits went way up because now the audience member feels like they're part of the action sequence. So I don't think we'll ever be replaced. The thing that has changed that we're not using as many stunt people as we used back in Hal Needham's day or my day, you know, we used to use 200, 300 stunt people, you know, for a big fight scene. Nowadays you use 50 and they make it look like 300 or a thousand because CGI can replace all the background and that's fine. But, there's a lot more content today. There's a lot more movies being made that were made 40 years ago. So I think it's evened out in that we have more stunt people in the business now than we ever had. And we have them worldwide. Whereas when I first started in the business, if you went to anything outside of the United States, there was only three or four stunt people that worked there. Now there's a thousand and 2000. And so it's gotten to be a bigger business. It's never going to go away. The audience wants to see real people doing real things. And you know, I think it's here to stay. 184 credits for stunts, 12 as an actor, and 43 credits as a second unit director or assistant director and growing. When it's all done, Jack, how do you want your legacy to be remembered? I mean, I think I think it's it's something that I just want people to understand that we're here for entertainment purposes only. Even though we're risk risking our lives, we are risking our lives to give you entertainment. And I think if, if I have films that have lasted throughout the years and people still watch them because of the action or because something that I put in it, that's what makes me happy. I'm, a, uh, I'm happy that people can look at a film 20 years later and say, God, I really love that. Um, and that still happens to me. I have somebody that comes up just the other day that said, I loved the car chase you did in date night. When those two cars were stuck together going through New York, that was so funny. And I loved it. And that makes me happy. I think that's my legacy is just people enjoying movies that I did throughout the years and they last. 
Well, thank you for everything you've done in the movie industry. And thank you for taking time and being on my show. I appreciate both ends. Okay. Thanks, Tommy. People follow me on Instagram at before the lights podcast. And if you would take 30 seconds, go rate and review the show anywhere you follow podcasts for me. Thank you for listening to before the lights. I'm Tommy Canale. And until next time, everybody, I salute a chin chin. Chin chin.